Well, good morning. good morning, and welcome to Williamsburg Presbyterian Church. I am Pastor Pam Hernser, and as you can see, Pastor John Morgan and Pastor Rachel A. Bear are out of town this weekend. I'm going solo, <laughs> but not really. We have Elder Larry Pulley, who is assisting me in worship, and of course, we have our wonderful choir and Tom Bozek as the liturgists. As many of you know, Pastor Rachel is now Reverend Dr. Rachel A. Bear. Her graduation is next Saturday, May 27th at 10 a.m. at First Presbyterian Church in Richmond. All are welcome to attend. Check your bulletin for more details. I also want to let you know that it is Abby Comey's last Sunday with us. You are in, a tr you're in for a treat with the anthem that she is going to sing. Abby is moving to Washington, D.C. to teach English. And again, Abby, we wish you abundant blessings on this next adventure. In a sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, Pat Peck Beckler, Chris's mom, died this past Friday, May 19th. In addition, we recently learned that Dottie Harris died on May 17th. Please keep Chris and his family and Dottie's family in your prayers. And so now let's open our mind, our heart, and our soul to the leading of the Holy Spirit as we worship God and encounter Jesus Christ. And now I invite our liturgist, Tom Bozak, to share the concerns of the church. Good morning and welcome to worship at Williamsburg Presbyterian Church. A special welcome to those who are worshiping with us by radio. Please take a moment to pass and sign the friendship register where you can find a prayer request card to share a joy or concern. Ours is an active church Additional information about upcoming programs can be found in your bulletin and on the church website, mywpc.org. I have one announcement here. Williams WPC's Thriving Congregations team would like to remind you that no, uh, tomorrow, Monday at 7 p.m., is the training for house meeting leaders and scribes. If you'd like to help us with this work, or if you have questions, please sign up in the Welcome Center following worship. These are the announcements.
Let the righteous be joyful. Let them rejoice before God. Let us all be jubilant with joy. Sing to God, all peoples of the world. Sing praises to God, most high. From the sanctuary of heaven, God gives life and renews the face of the earth. Let the righteous be joyful. Let them rejoice before God. Let us all be jubilant with joy. sisters, God not only desires our repentance, but longs to offer us forgiveness. Therefore, cast all your anxiety on God, because God cares for you eternally. Loving God, we confess that we do not always bring honor and glory to your name. We are rebellious and weak. We flee before your goodness. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us by the grace and mercy of Christ, that we may rise up again in peace to love and serve your world. Amen.
sisters and brothers, the Spirit of God is resting on you to restore, support, and strengthen you. Therefore, be at peace in the one who forgives and loves you. Rise up and give God thanks. see a few people hiding behind the uh, organ there. <laughs> and he has a Bible. All right. So today I want to talk to y'all a little bit about the book the scripture is coming from. And we know this book, right? Right. And you know this book is made up of a bunch of books, right? Yeah. Yep. So let's look at the table of contents here. Let's see if we can find yours. Lots of other pages. There it is. So we're talking about the book of Acts. So we're here in the New Testament. Fifth book down. After Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are known as the Gospels. That means good news, and that means that they are the story of Jesus and his life. X is like the first sequel, the first follow-up movie after Jesus' life. You ever seen something that's part two? Yeah. X is part two. And... Just like any good movie sequel, it starts by reminding you where you left off in the story. And it starts with, in this first book, Thessalonians, or just was called Theo, I wrote about all the things that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day he was taken up to heaven, giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So, First book. The first book that he's speaking of is actually what we know as the book of Luke. Because if you look at the first verses of Luke here, you have to write an orderly account of you, most excellent Theo. So again, that's how we know that this is the sequel to that. And what we're going to talk about today is, again, where that book ends. We come back to that day where Jesus is taken up to heaven. And so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or the periods the Father has set of his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That seems like a good way to kick off a new story, isn't it? And so that's how we kick off the story of, guess what? The church. The book of Acts is all about how the church comes to be and what it does. So today, as Pastor Pam reads scripture and preaches, pay attention to what she says about the church and recognize that once again, the story of Jesus doesn't come to a complete end but we're living in the sequel. So let's pray. God, thank you for continuing your story through us. May we live a life that is honoring of you and the stories that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. 
God of life, your spirit inspired the prophets and writers of scripture. Your scripture helps us to acknowledge him as Lord. We ask that you will send your spirit now to give us deeper insight, encouragement, faith, and hope through the proclamation of the gospel. Amen. The first scripture lesson is from John chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave to me. So now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those who gave me the world, to you who gave me the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave me, I have given to them and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name, that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Friends, please join me in the responsive reading of Psalm 68. <clears throat> o Comforter, let our fears be transformed, that all that keeps us separated and confused. As smoke is blown away, so let our fears rise up before you. As wax melts before fire, let our fears become melted by love. Then we will be released from bondage. We will exalt before the beloved. We will be jubilant with joy. Yes, the beloved will empower us with love as we face the fears of the enemy. Love even whispers, I will break down the walls of illusion. I will shatter the fears that bind, that you may walk in a new dawn, that you may dance with light hearts and spread peace throughout the earth. Our second lesson today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive, pow you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going, they were gazing up toward heaven. Suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, 
They went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of our Lord. Thank you. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this story about Jesus' ascension not only occurs here at the beginning of Acts, but it is also at the very end of the Gospel of Luke. In the Gospel of Luke, the story of Jesus' ascension serves as a climatic ending to the victorious resurrection of Jesus. In Acts, the ascension of Jesus serves as the beginning of a new story of the ongoing presence of the resurrection. The author of both Luke and Acts is creating movement from Jesus' ministry on earth to his continued ministry through his disciples and all the generations that follow to share the good news with all people. When Jesus rises into the clouds, he is in essence passing the baton of his ministry to his disciples. As we heard in our first lesson from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 10, and now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Protect them in your name that you have given me, so they may be one as we are one. See, the disciples have spent three years with Jesus, witnessing his miracles, listening to him teach, watching them heal and care for people. And then they spent 40 more days with him after the resurrection. It is at this point that Jesus believes they are ready to carry on his ministry. Listen again to the opening verses and listen carefully for how the pronoun you is used to move the ministry of the gospel from Jesus himself to his disciples. Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the father has set by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after that statement, Jesus just rises up into the clouds. Can you imagine what was going through the disciples' minds? The disciples just went through the horrible ordeal of Jesus' crucifixion. Then they were overjoyed by the resurrection, and better yet, Jesus spent 40 more days with them. I think they were just hoping, just hoping that Jesus would just fix everything. And instead, Jesus leaves and basically says, it's up to you. They are now responsible for the continued ministry of Jesus Christ to share the good news, to help the world see there is another way to live through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, as I thought about what the disciples experienced with Jesus' ascension, about what it must have felt like to be given such enormous responsibility, it occurred to me that this transfer of responsibility is similar 
not the same, but it's similar to when I soloed a military jet for the first time. Now, I had read the manuals, taken the test. I had watched my instructor pilot demo maneuvers, takeoffs, and landings, and I practiced maneuvers, takeoffs, and landings under my instructor's supervision. Then one day, it was time. We land, we pull over to the side of the taxiway, we shut down an engine, and my instructor gets out of the airplane. Now, it was all up to me to take all the knowledge and skill I learned to use it successfully to take off and land this jet. I was both nervous and excited. I knew I was capable, but what really gave me confidence is my instructor who got out of the plane is basically non-verbally saying, you are ready. I believe you can do it. Now, though I was solo and flying and responsible for flying the airplane, I was not alone. And no, I'm not going to say that Jesus was my co-pilot. <laughs> I was responsible for flying the jet, but I was also part of a community of airplanes flying around the traffic pattern. And near the runway is a building with three people inside who has specific duties to keep all those aircraft, including myself, safe. In addition, there is a tower, there's air traffic control, and if there is an emergency, there is even more help. So though I'm flying solo, I was also part of a larger community to keep me and others safe. Now, this experience of being entrusted with the responsibility of soloing a jet is not unique to the flying world. Athletes train and they are coached, and then one day they are selected to go on the court or on the field or in the race. They embody all that they have learned to compete. Performers who sing, act, and play instruments all practice, train, and work with their instructors and coaches to embody their craft. And I am certain that each of you can think of a time when you were trained and nurtured into a role of soloing, taking responsibility to embody the skill you have been taught. See, soloing is not about doing whatever you want. It is not about acting independently of what you've been taught. Rather, soloing is to exemplify all that you have learned. I share these examples to help us appreciate the importance of this transition in Jesus' ministry from himself to his disciples and all who follow after as they exemplify Jesus' teachings. We are worshiping here today because Jesus got out of the plane believing his disciples were ready to carry on his ministry. Jesus is no longer physically present to lead, guide, and answer questions. It is now up to the disciples to embody all they were taught and all they experienced to share the good news of the gospel, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be Christ in the world. They are going solo as part of the ministry and community of their Lord Jesus Christ, guided by the Holy Spirit. Consider again, that we are worshiping here today because the disciples and certain women and his brothers accepted the responsibility to witness to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Maybe 15 people gathered in a room to pray and wait. Then, with the power of the Holy Spirit, they brought to the world the power of love, the power of compassion, the power of forgiveness, the power of the resurrection to transform lives in meaningful and practical ways. The disciples are going solo 
not independent of Christ, but because of Christ. Now it is our turn to embody Christ through our own life experiences and faith and the life experiences and faith of others. We are called to embody Christ through what we learn in our Sunday school classes and small groups and what we learn and experience by serving together and worshiping together. We are called to share our faith with others to build the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. As I mentioned, when I soloed for the first time, I was part of a flying community that gave me the skills to fly and also continued to teach and empower me to become a better pilot. We as Christians are also part of a community that nurtures our faith, holds us accountable, cares for us if we are in need, and with the power of the Holy Spirit, encourages us to be more like Christ. Did you hear what was in common with both soloing an airplane and becoming Christ-like? It's community. The church is the community where we learn the stories about our faith, both the ones in the Bible and the ones we share with one another. The church is the community where we encounter Christ in one another and become Christ as we serve others. The church is the community where we can experience now the abundant internal life Christ offers in order that we can share that life with others. The church is the community where we are mentored in our faith and we mentor others in their faith. The church is the community where we care for one another when we're sick or lonely or facing life's difficulties. Why is this all important? Because the world needs the church to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Loneliness and lack of meaningful re relationships is an epidemic. Arthur Randy Frazier says in his book, The Connecting Church, quote, George Gallup Jr. concluded from his studies and polls that Americans are the, among the loneliest people in the world. Fraser's research found social media has caused people to create identities rather than living into their God-created being. According to Our World and Data, a nonprofit out of Oxford University, nine out of 10 people believe the world is getting worse. Add in the 24 hours news cycle, and it makes sense that so many people are discontented with life. The ministry of Jesus Christ passed on to his disciples and on to the many generations after and now to us offers hope and the truth of a different life, a life abundant and eternal marked by God's love, God's compassion, God's forgiveness. Theologian Dr. Walter Brueggemann says this about God's prophetic vision. In the assertion of God's newness, the prophet is engaged in a daring act of imagination whereby they host a, host a possible world that is not yet in view. If we are to be faithful heirs and practitioners of this daring prophetic imagination, then we too, in the wake of the prophet, are summoned to engage in daring imagination concerning new historical possibility. The heirs of the prophetic tradition are not captured but what they see in front of them, nor are they smitten by a preoccupation with what was once treasured. Prophetic imagination is the anticipation of the new social possibility that is available from the intention of, God, of the God of the prophets, end quote. So keep that quote in mind and listen about some information from our World and Data nonprofit. Our World and Data found that though people think the world is getting worse, 
Their 200-year study on global health found the opposite. There have been significant strides in reducing extreme poverty, increasing literacy, improving health, freedom, and basic education. Our world and data goal is not to mitigate the significant problems we still face. Their goal is to show us that we are capable of making positive, meaningful, and lasting change and to encourage us to continue to improve our world for all people. A quote from this report, it is not possible for a single person to change the world. The transformation of our living conditions was possible only because of collaboration. It is our collective brains and our collaborative effort that are needed for such a revolution." End quote. After Jesus' ascension, a group of people gathered in a room and prayed. I believe they embrace Jesus Christ's prophetic vision and with their collective brains and collaborative efforts, they began a prophetic revolution for people to live abundantly and eternally through Jesus Christ. Though they lived during a very oppressive time, ruled by violence and fear, they went solo with Jesus' movement. A movement ruled by Christ's love, compassion, forgiveness, and justice. Christianity emerged and spread. According to sociologist Rodney Stark in his book, The Rise of Christianity, Christianity spread because Christians cared for the sick during plagues. Women were valued and allowed to worship. They had tighter social cohesion and mutual help made it possible for them to withstand disaster, disasters. Stark concludes, and I quote, the primary means of its growth was through the united and motivated efforts of the growing number of Christian believers who invited their friends, neighbors, and relatives to share the good news, end quote. The good news, a better way of life than the world offers, a better way of life that, that which is abundant and eternal through Jesus Christ. Friends, Jesus has gotten out of the plane. Jesus believes in us, and Jesus believes we are capable of continuing his ministry. So with the power of the Holy Spirit, we are going solo with our collective brains and our collaborative efforts as a community to share the good news. Amen.
Good morning. Please be, please be seated. Oh, no, they stand for the Oh, stand, sorry. sorry. Please keep standing. <laughs> Join me in the affirmation of faith printed in the bulletin. We are certain that Jesus lives. He lives as God with us, touching all of human life with the presence of God. He lives as one of us with God. Because he shares our humanity and is bound himself in love, we have an advocate in the innermost life of God. We declare that Jesus is Lord. His resurrection is a decisive victory over the powers that deform and destroy human life. His lordship is hidden. The world appears to be dominated by people and systems that do not acknowledge his rule. But his lordship is real. It demands our loyalty and sets us free from the fear of all lesser lords who threaten us. We maintain that ultimate sovereignty now belongs to Jesus Christ in every sphere of life. Jesus is Lord. He has been Lord from the beginning. He will be Lord at the end. Even now, he is Lord. Now please be seated. We will now offer our prayers of petition to God. Today we have a responsive element to our morning prayer as indicated in the bulletin. When you hear me say, fill us with your spirit's power, we will all respond with that we may be one with Christ, as Christ is one with you. Let us pray. Redeeming God, you call us to devote ourselves constantly to prayer for the sake of Jesus Christ. Therefore, let us offer our prayers this day on behalf of your church in the world, saying, fill us with your spirit's power, that we may be one with Christ, as Christ is one with you. Rescuing God, for those who are and feel alone, you provide a refuge and comfort and lead them into the abundant life. Help us to order the patterns of how we think and act to support the health of your human family and the welfare of your world. Fill us with your spirit's power that we may be one with Christ as Christ is one with you. Steadfast God, you have given to your church the inheritance of faith in Christ alone and bestowed your spirit's love upon us to make us one in you. Help us to grow in strength, understanding, and courage that we may be willing and able to witness to this hope that all may embrace and know your saving love eternally in Christ. Fill us with your spirit's power that we may be one with Christ as Christ is one with you. Life-giving God, you send rain in abundance to relieve the parched crops and thirsty land and you make clean the winds of heaven. Help us to pursue and adopt sustainable solutions as we seek to honor and care for the well-being of your creation. Fill us with your spirit's power that we may be one with Christ as Christ is one with you. Loving God, you heard the sufferings of your people, listened to our cries, and sent a son into our world that was no stranger to our pain. Help us to reflect your love and offer your healing and compassion in ministries to others in the name of Christ. Fill us with your spirit's power that we may be one with Christ as Christ is one with you. Resurrecting God, you draw us near to those who are sick and dying and you call them home to you. May we all know your peace, which passes all understanding, and the joy of life eternal we have with you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now we join to pray together the prayer Jesus gave to us to call our own. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus said to the Father, all mine are yours and all yours are mine. And in James, we learn that all our gifts come from above. Therefore, let us offer to God this day our lives and labors in service to Christ's love. It is both our opportunity and our responsibility to return as gifts and recommit in service a portion of what we have been given.
Let us pray. Glorious God, everything that is given to us rains forth out of the abundance of your love, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Bless these gifts and our lives together, that all we are and all we offer give glory to you. In the name of Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Well, welcome. It is a gift that we could gather together and worship God. A special welcome to our visitors and any family that's in town for the graduate William & Mary graduation. That was yesterday. We are so glad you are here. If you want to know more about Williamsburg Presbyterian Church, you can ask me or Pastor John or Rachel or any of the wonderful people who are sitting with next to you. But also there are, are some ministry events that are coming up, which is a great way to check us out. On June 3rd, the Earth Care Committee is having a uh, Clean the Bay Day. Um, there's a Presbyterian Weathering Women Gathering, their annual lunch, which is Wednesday. VBS is coming and thriving congregations. So please check your bulletins, the websites, and your emails. There is a lot going on. Along with being an active church, we are a caring church. If you are someone in need, please reach out to any of the pastors. We also have Stephen Ministers, which are confidential one-on-one -on -one care, and our deacons are always ready to help. So please let us know. With grateful hearts, let's share the peace of Christ with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Jesus believes in us. 
Jesus believes we are capable of sharing the good news. And Jesus has gotten out of the plane. We're go solo and share God's love and compassion with the world. Receive the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the church be a beacon of hope guiding all, all of God's children home. Amen. Hello, I'm Reverend Pam Hernser, along with Reverend John Morgan, Reverend Rachel A. Bear, and the Congregation of Williamsburg Presbyterian Church. We are delighted you joined us for worship. We encourage you to sign our Friendship Register, where you can leave a comment, a question, or a prayer request. You can find our Friendship Register on our online worship page or by typing in mywpc.org forward slash friendship. We also want to encourage you to explore our website where you can learn more about the people and the ministries of our church family. All are welcome here. We look forward to worshiping with you again. Until then, grace and peace as we journey with God together.